Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for our webinar. I wanted to thank uh, Implant Direct for uh, a sponsorship. So grab your cup of tea or coffee and enjoy the webinar. Our topic from today is uh, socket preservation, improve your patient's treatment options. But uh, before I will uh, start my presentation, I will um, uh, like to give credit to my team and my family. They are giving me all the support to be successful and to provide a great service to my patients. Thank you. Products covered by this webinar are bone grafting materials and membranes. I am using Implant Direct products every day in my practice and I will present my cases from my experience. Protocols that are working great in my hands and other examples from the literature as well. Following tooth extraction, the alveolar bone undergoes remodeling. Complicated tooth extraction procedures may also lead to additional bone loss due to surgical trauma. If a tooth requires extraction, implant therapy is often considered one of the best options today to replace the tooth functionally and as well aesthetically. However, Sufficient alveolar bone, volume, and favorable architecture of the alveolar ridge are essential to obtain an ideal functional and aesthetic reconstruction following implant placement. But what is the goal? The goal is to minimize the three-dimensional changes of the extraction side. We are, um, what are we planning to achieve with socket preservation or guided bone regeneration one more time? We are going to have less, uh, we are going to uh, try to prevent less socket shrinkage. Topics of discussions of today, they are how socket preservation helps my practice, case acceptance, how do I get started, basic steps for less traumatic extractions, and practice growth with socket preservation. But there is no better time than today uh, to add to your pyramid of knowledge. Delivering the bad news to the patient can be devastating. This kind of news can create trust issues, and if they are not delivered with confidence, patient cannot trust our decisions, and uh, they can seek advice for a second opinion, and I'm sure that happens to everyone. We need to prepare to discuss alternative risk and benefits treatment options with our patients. But what are the most wanted answers? I know that you are here today to hear all about the best recipe in the mix. But what is the best recipe? Are we going to flab, or flapless, squeeze the socket or not, firmly pack the bone or gently pack? What kind of bone graft are we going to place? Are we going to mix it or we are going to use only one kind? How about the buckled bone? How long do we have to wait? How important are the sutures and how about the primary closure? Blood is life indeed, and yes, this is my slogan when I'm talking about regeneration. The success of bone grafting is uh, ultimately uh, dependent upon vascularization and remodeling of the grafted bone into vital, load-bearing bone. I am going to mention this line, by the way, more than one time by the end of the webinar. But how do sockets heal? And I hope you like the images. I want you to think cube. I like art and I like fashion. The red cube uh, from New York, Art of Noguki, a Japanese sculpture which is uh, uh, very famous, is not in between us anymore. It was Brinkushi's assistant and uh, he can remind us of socket healing. The dress as well if you have some imagination. So the healing starts from the walls and we need a blood clot stabilization, so we do need as many walls possible. Bone healing is slower than tissue healing and, and here is the rationality of placing a wound dressing like a membrane or even patient's own tissue. But the quick question is again related to blood. Does the bone loss occur due lack of vascularization? And we have to remember the coronal part of the socket is the critical part and we are going to find out in a short video. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Dr. Francesco Barbosa from Spain 
for this amazing video that he put together for Periospot. You can learn more from his uh, Periospot uh, website as well. And I wanted to thank Dr. Kardalopoli, which in 2003, he put together a phenomenal research in dynamics after extractions. So let's watch the video together. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the video. It was fantastic, and thank you again, uh, Dr. Francesco. He told me to tell you that he is a nice guy. But how about uh, sockets classification? There are so many socket classification in the literature, but I like to keep it simple. So I'm using Dr. Salama's classification, and uh, we are talking about type 1, type 2, and type 3 socket. And type 1 socket is just a simple socket in tech walls and soft tissue. And we are going to call the procedures if you wanted to do uh, to place the biomaterials as a socket preservation. In type 2 socket, the buckle plate has uh, some defect, and uh, we are going to call that procedure a socket augmentation. And in type 3 socket, the buckle plate, as well and interproximal bone defect, um, has um, uh, we are calling um, we are recommending for this an orthodontic extrusion first, then augmentation. That's why it's so important to not to elevate interproximal bone because this is so important for this. How socket preservation helps my practice? I am providing a great service to my patients using socket preservation and GBR procedures. Informing patients about their about their choices reflects your level of education. So I wanted to be educated. Avoiding big expenses later, like uh, bridge reconstruction, sinus lift, you name it. Creating a great foundation for your future restorations, like uh, uh, partials, in place restoration, of course, the first choice, even pontic for your bridges. And nevertheless, um, revenue for your practice as well. Now let's talk about case acceptance. And my first weapon is education. So I spend a lot of time at the chair side for new patients as well for implant consultations. Since we are living in a visual society and we are all communicating by emojis these days, I am using a lot of visual tools as pictures, mandible models, as well as x-rays. My favorite line is uh, you are going to lose jawbone and your face will age in absence of replacing what's missing. But let's take a look at this x-ray and the picture. Patient has a fractured tooth uh, with a large periapical radioluc radiolucency. And um, um, the defect is going to be large after this tooth is removed. And I explain the patient this issue using my x-ray drawing tools on the screen. This is a type 2 socket with missing buckle bone where we need to perform a GBR. Uh, there are many things to consider at human planning. Uh, before tooth extraction, and those things are, of course, pink, the soft tissue quality and volume, and the volume of the bone, the root shape, the root trunk, and sinus and anatomy as well. This is Liliana's case, a full mouth rehab case. As you can see on the upper left side, she has a hard and soft tissue deficiency. I'm using here a limited orthodontics, uh, six months miles, uh, to open the bite and create enough room for my future restorations. But sometimes we have to start by building the soft tissue before we do any uh, bone graft procedures, which I did in this case. As you can see in this picture, I had the freenum pool and I have a very shallow vestibule. So I decided to go in with an epithelial graft. As you can see, I still have some sutures left on the screen, on the picture. And now I have something to work with. 
But how fast and how much bone loss after tooth extraction? We know from Shrub from 2003 that in the first 12 months we have major ch changes after tooth extraction. And two-thirds of the socket reduction occurs in the first three months. Also from Johnson in 1963, we are losing about half of the bone total width in the first year, which means about five to seven millimeters. Talking about how fast and how much bone loss, let's review two of my implant cases, A and B. In case A, patient lost his molar about seven years ago. His bridge was failing and I ended up placing two implants. You can appreciate horizontal deficiency of the ridge. Um, and in case B, patient lost the tooth only about one year ago and I did everything in my power to keep the premolar next door to have a better aesthetic regarding papilla to maintain the interproximal bone height since the tooth is part of her smile line. Both cases A and B were resolved by soft tissue management, special flap designs and grafts, but this can be another topic for my next webinar. As dental professionals, we believe in evidence-based dentistry, and for this reason, I added some literature slides on this topic. We believe in immediate implants, and the, the dimensional change of the extraction socket in regards to immediate implants was studied for many years by many important people in dental field, and the results are different, and let's take a look at it. In 2003, Schraub uh, came with a number of 5.9 millimeter change in the buccal dimension, and Lekovic in 1997 has a 4.43 millimeter uh, buccal change. Not too much change in vertical dimension due to the lingual plate anchorage. So it's the, the lingual bone is held by the lingual plate. These studies were done with open flaps, so remember that. Very limited data is present on dimensional changes without flaps and immediate implants. And let's take a look in 2011 at Grunder. And um, his study from 2011 demonstrated about one millimeter buccal lingual change only. And another study done by Dr. Tano Chu and Dr. Salama show less than one millimeter, which is uh, 0 0.1 value. It's a very big difference and uh, no flaps to go is, is the way to go and that's why guided surgery is getting big on this topic and I am a big fan of it. I used to pla flap everything in my practice uh, before when I started to place implants and now I'm a big, I am a big fan of guided surgery. And to complement this topic we have um, more studies the placement of a biomaterial in the socket failed to prevent resorption of the buccal and, and palatal bone walls. That was published by, by a radio in 2014. Autologous bone chips placed in the fresh extraction socket will not prevent ridge resorption. And that occurred during healing following tooth extraction published in 2011. And implant placement failed to preserve the bone dimension of the ridge following tooth extraction as well. This is uh, in, published in 2006. But there is more to the plate, right? So how about the success factors? We know we have many factors interfering uh, with the implant placement, and that was demonstrated uh, by Atwood, and those factors can be related with um, their metabolic, anatomic, functional, prosthetic, and as well our surgical technique, which is uh, so important. Now I'm going to show we, I'm going to share with you my second secret weapon, which is the photography. And I'm going to uh, share on the screen a little video regarding um, my server, which I'm using every day. I have two cameras in my practice, one a flash ring and the studio lights, and the photography plays a major role in my practice. It's the most visual tool that I'm using every day. I'm using photography for case acceptance education, documentations for medical legal issues, and social media marketing. Photography made me a better clinician and a better surgeon. But let's talk about Liliana. This is a ridge defect talk. So Liliana is a class 3 occlusion. Uh, she does not have 
any to this lay, or maybe just a bit. But while she's talking, and I made a video, by the way, she doesn't talk, doesn't show any to this lay. She had her um, uh, teeth extraction on the anterior areas of many years ago, and of course the lower anterior segment super erupted. So I am using six months miles to be able to get this case done at the um, uh, high standards of, of care. And you can see here, I, I took many, many pictures during the treatment. And uh, Liliana is getting better and better. I did about um, three wax ups on this case. The technician was fantastic. And sometimes uh, we have to rely on our technicians when we cannot create pink. So as you can see, the final result is outstanding. And uh, when the blade cannot do it, let the technician can do it. And thank you so much for this amazing work. And let's move on. And how do I get started with this? And I will say no to botch dentistry. Botched is a very popular reality television series here in California, a show where talented doctors are fixing many errors or poor outcome of plastic surgeries. And dentistry should have it too, I believe. But knowledge is power, and we want the best interest for our patients. We want the best function and aesthetic outcome. Thank you, Dr. Cafedara from Romania, for sharing me this picture. I'll give you credit for this. How about soft tissue? We don't want it to wait more than six months when we are planning to place a delayed immediate uh, implant. So do not wait too long because your soft tissue is going to um, go away. And in uh, 1998, um, Lekovic and co-workers demonstrated just by using a bioabsorbable membrane, he improved um, uh, the, the quality of bone and uh, he achieved less shrinkage of the socket. But how about, um, we have a little talk about the membranes and uh, the resorbable membranes and non-resorbable membranes. And the resorbable membranes, they have different time of resorption and that can be up to 36 weeks. The non-resorbable membranes, uh, they require a second uh, time surgery. Sometimes they increase uh, morbidity. So you are going to see a couple of examples that I use in my practice and for each individual case. But many choices are available to the clinician, and the success is based on the treatment at the extraction time. Uh, Hardwick, I believe in 1994, named several properties for the membranes. And they are biocompatibility, integration, cell occlusiveness, space maintenance, and clinical manageability. Implant Direct has many choices for membranes, as you can see on the pictures, but the most popular are RTM, which is a resorbable membrane, and my favorite, the cytoplast, which is a non-resorbable membrane. How about the bone graft materials? An ideal bone graft material should have three properties. Should be osteogenic, should be osteoinductive, and osteoconductive. Bone grafting can, be, uh, uh, can arise in packages like vials with particles, they come in different sizes, not too small to provide for the food for the macrophage, or not too big to develop stochastic in the bone. Also available in party, flowable, uh, blocks, membrane sheets, and it can be mixed with saline, uh, sterile saline, blood, or any biological factors, such as APRF or APRF, uh, known as blood derivatives. But how do I get started? I am going to know the bone physiology, and you saw the little video, perform less traumatic extractions. I can't say our traumatic extraction because we're still producing a trauma to the tissue. Know your biomaterials and, of course, know your host. But what about the bone? Bone is a dynamic matrix, a type 1 collagen formed from an unorganic component and an organic component as well. And the main bone cells are osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocytes. Osteoblasts are primarily responsible for organic matrix na named osteoid. Alkaline phosphatases produced by osteoblast is responsible for bone remineralization. Osteocytes are the retired osteoblasts. They represent 95% of bone cells that are responsible for mechanical loading, and they act as a mechanic mechanosensors. Let's talk about the osteoclast. 
they are the cells which are bad to the bone, like the rock song, but they are responsible for bone resorption. Without them, regeneration will be impossible, so we need them. Bone graft materials are autograft from the patient, allograft, xenograft from animals, bovine and equine, equine means, means a horse, alloplast can be synthetic, uh, we are talking about um, defects that can be repaired in three ways, osteogenesis, osteoinduction, and osteoconduction. Inductivity is related to bone processing, and um, demineralized bone means no minerals, only proteins left, and yes, is the osteoinductive. Mineralized bone means no proteins, only minerals left, means osteoconductive, and that's going to help you uh, to understand the biomaterials and it's going to help you to, to do your orders when you're going to talk with your implant companies or your carriers. Now, what's the difference between cantilens versus cortical bone? The cantilens bone, which is called the spongious bone, resorbs faster. It's less dense, has more cells and proteins, uh, is less mineralized as well, and the cortical bone resorbs slowly, is more dense, and is 95% mineralized. Now, what we are going to order, we are going to ask for a cantalos, we are going to ask for a cortical, or we are going to do a mix. Cortical is used for space maintenance or instability, and the cantalus bone used for faster remodeling. And, of course, we can do mixed cortical and cantalus, and implant rack has a 50-50 product as well. But who is more inductive, cantalus or cortical? Of course, cantalus, because it contains more proteins, which are responsible for the inductive properties. Let's take a look at this case, a young female patient, 35 years old, and came in for an implant consultation. And these pictures are just fabulous to demonstrate to your patients what can happen if you are missing teeth and you are not replacing at the proper time. So the teeth are migrating, the opposing tooth is going to extrude, and sometimes we have to uh, do additional procedure to reconstruct the dentulous area. And here I perform an epithelial graft before my orthodontic treatment, and I'm trying to upright that molar and place an implant later on. But did you say high five to the sinus? Because I did, and I did many times. If you say five to your sinus, it's okay. Sometimes the sinus depends on the, the defect is closing by itself. And um, when the defect is large, like in this case, I ended up extracting two uh, infected molars. This case was sent uh, to me by the ENT. Uh, well, I knew I have to have a backup to fix this case. I didn't want it to be embarrassed to send this case to the oral surgery or the ENT. I just wanted to get it done in the office. So, uh, I'm going to show you how I fix it, and before that, I just want to look at the data and telling you uh, the sinus opening is very frequent, and you can charge extra for, uh, for doing this procedure. And in 2015, uh, Kang uh, published a study and took in consideration about 1,056 teeth, and in the lead, they are the second molar with the 44.7%, First molar with the 40.5, the premolars, the, the second premolars are 14.8, and as well the first premolar is 1.5. So even when you are going to extract the first premolar, you still have a chance to get to the sinus. But I know that uh, Dr. Williams um, is working right now, the Williams Crawford, in a big, big study. 12,000 subjects uh, trying to figure out if um, the correlation between the roots and the sinus floor, and this data will come up uh, very soon. So let me tell you about my tips when I'm talking about the sinus, and I'm using two things, and I wanted to have this as a backup in my office. First, I'm using a, uh, I can use a cytoplasm membrane and can be reinforced with titanium. This membrane is amazing because it can be exposed in oral cavity, it can be sutures as well, and uh, it can be removed in about three, three weeks and leaves an amazing tissue underneath. And it's used also for any space creation, maintenance while grafting. The titanium provides membrane with their shape, memory, and rigidity, and can be exposed, as I said, and comes in different sizes, and it's made from dense PTFE, which is less than 0 0.3, 0 0.3 pore size, which is almost impenetrable by bacteria. 
I wanted to share with you that I really like to use this for GBR. Busser, Busser was one of the first clinicians in 1990 to report a successful re-documentation with GBR in humans using the EPDFE membrane and tanning pins. And the hottest uh, subject in dentistry about the buccal plate and treated with gold. And uh, we know the blood supply towards the buccal plate is uh, uh, has different sources. The first source is the PDL, and PDL has about 10% of the vascularity. And the second source is periosteum, and the third one is bone marrow, which is in a small quantity. So we want we don't want it to bother the buccal plate. And uh, I wanted to share with you uh, this study, the prospective randomized control clinical trial. Uh, to evaluate bone preservation using implants with different geometry placed into extraction sockets in the maxilla and was published in 2010 and about 64.1 percent of uh, the subject had only 0.5 millimeter in anterior area and 24.1 uh, in the posterior and uh, 1 millimeter uh, had 23 0.1 in anterior and 35.2 percent in posterior, which is so little. That's how we need to treat it um, as gold. This is Wendy, and uh, came to my practice with a fractured tooth. As soon as you see the clinical uh, pictures, or you, I can see inside his mouth, um, he has a crack in the tooth. The tooth is non-restorable. I see an infection coming through the buccal plate. And I know that buccal plate is not intact. We ended up and, uh, extracting the tooth. I am expecting, uh, expecting the, the walls in the upper right area. And in this case, I use the ice cream cone technique described by Dr. Tarno. I wanted to make sure before my uh, augmentation, I do uh, the infection control, I do curettage, I uh, wash the socket uh, with saline, and sometimes I'm entering some metronidazole to my graft. And in this case, I use a, a cytoplasm membrane, an RTM collagen membrane. This is a type 2 socket. I made a little flap, which I'm not sure today if I would do the same thing. And uh, I ended up placing here actually an allograft. And we are going to see the, the continuation of this case. Now, Randy disappeared. And um, I had to do any delayed implant placement. But as you can see with the allograph, the ridge was maintained fabulous on the posterior. And I was able to place an implant uh, uh, right in the middle of the ridge. As you can see on the, the right side, I lost some um, papilla in between the teeth, which is kind of OK because it's a posterior area. Now talking about this membrane, it's a, it's a very popular membrane. And uh, one of the most popular and the resorption is between 26 and 38 weeks and then can be used for many, many reasons. It can be for repairs, period defects, windows, for sinus lift, periopical lesions as well. The fibroblasts just enjoy crawling on top of it, so it's very friendly to the fibroblasts. Now, Dr. Villardi from Pennsylvania in 2005 came with a paper on internal barrier membrane technique versus ice cream cone technique and which one is better. So um, this is what he did. Um, he suggested to insert the membrane in the socket without raising the flap, extending the membrane about 2 mm beyond deficiency. He added bone graft bios, bios collagen compressed towards the buccal plate, and the socket was overfilled to avoid collapsing of the soft tissue. A three-sort free flow membrane was used on top of the socket and sutures. The volume of the tissue is maintained very well with this procedure. Now, the pictures are posted here of this young man, uh, which is 16 years old, and, and uh, presented to my practice for an implant consultation. He lost his front tooth in a car accident, and he is using a flipper for the past two years. Patient is not a candidate for an implant at this point. He needs to complete growing. But I am lucky. His lip line is extremely low, and he has a big, uh, a very thick biotype. However, he wanted a more permanent solution for his front tooth. On the upper right side picture, you can see the damage from the stay plate he's wearing for the past um, years. And uh, also, the stay plate is a tissue supported. Today, I'm encouraging to do an Essex uh, retainer with a tooth, which is a tooth supported 
which is going to be much friendly with the bone underneath as well. Now here I have an amazing uh, implant case. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate Dr. Tarno's uh, technique regarding the immediate implant placement and the provisional. And if you are planning to place your first implant on the anterior zone, I do recommend to start with the lateral. Lateral showed, um, the lateral too showed in, the ma in many studies that has a little bit thicker bone than the central and um, it's a good opportunity for you to break the ice and do it. So here the tooth was broken at the gum line. The patient has a nice keratinized tissue around it. Uh, what I did, I uh, extracted to as less traumatic possible. I placed an implant direct um, implant. And uh, what I did at this time, I placed my cylindric abutment as suggested by Dr. Tarno. Uh, and also I placed bone graft. I like to, to um, graft my gaps always. I'm just uh, afraid of the collapsing of, of the tissue, especially you know, in the anterior area. So in this case, I'm using, um, I, um, I use a xenograft uh, product. And also, I ended up using uh, soft tissue from tuberosity. And we all know that tuberosity um, uh, soft tissue has less shrinkage than the one from the palate. And the smart way to do it is uh, to prepare your temporary crown. Uh, in this case, I use a patient's own um, uh, crown, ceramic crown, of course, is out of occlusion and I perforate it so I can have a screw retain. The best way to do it, to use a steamer and kill all that bacteria, have a nice smooth um, 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 surface and uh, also uh, adjust it with the composite, place it and if you don't have a steamer, get one, it's amazing and if you don't have a I'm using, I used in the past a gel from Perio Science and I'm just going around the temporary. As you can see here, this is the healing after four months, the patient returned and he's ready for his restoration. Now the secret is when we are going to insert that temporary crown here, you are going to push um, some bone graft outside, as you can see in the picture, as you can see next to my suture graft, the anchor graft, which I did for the from tuberosity, and that's going to compress your, your uh, tissue and you have less collapsing in three-dimensional proportions. Uh, I'm using as well autogenous bone as well. I like it to mix it with the bone graft or place it in intimate contact with the implant. Uh, I like it to take it from the third molar. The mandible is very, very popular. You can use a bone scraper or you can use your any tools you have. Even um, um, you can use a zirconium burst or you can use piezo. You can use even a bone graft or autogenous bone from your implant drilling as well. In a close intimacy with with the implant and then you're going to place your xenograft which is a slow resorption bone material. Now Dr. Kobe in 2008 came up with a new procedure called socket seal and he is using a patient's own tissue uh, to cover up the bone graft and this procedure is amazing. I think it's uh, holding pretty well for the soft tissue management but um, the success is probably from the non-closure of the flap. So do not squeeze your socket. Leave them, you know, leave them big. I like to have the volume. This was published in Journal of Periodontology and is amazing for the anteriors. And as well, you, you can see, you can use here an Essex uh, retainer replacing the front tooth. Now, since we are talking about anteriors, I wanted to share with you um, the PDL burr I'm using when I'm about to extract anterior teeth. So don't use elevators, use a very um, small periotome, you can use even a blade, a small blade, uh, or this PDL burr. Before I bought this PDL burr, I used my prepping burrs, my di long diamond, which is okay to use them. And uh, as well, if you get stuck with the fractured tooth in a socket, the best is to use your burrs, but do not destroy the walls and do not open flaps. So here is the result after I extracted the teeth. And if the patient cannot afford any, um, any bone graft material, use at least a collagen plug. These collagen plugs are phenomenal and this patient was a smoker, so I decided to place some collagens. And of course, the denture is going to serve as a hemostatic uh, tool on top of my, my socket as well. And this is the healing I got. 
uh, at one week. I like to do follow-ups up, you know, after my um, uh, my extractions as well. Direct gem facts. I like this material. It's a demineralized cortical allograft sheet um, and is a minimally processed human cortical tissue. And you can use it for a three-wall defect or an onlay to cover the graft. It's flexible, is osteoconductive, promotes vascularization and regrowth of the new bone. So this is a case I did. Unfortunately, I had to um, remove an implant in, uh, in, uh, in this case. I still had buccal bone, but I was not brave enough to place an implant right away because the patient had, had passed and I didn't want to take a chance. So in this case, I fabricated a stake bone uh, using APRF and IPRF mixed with biomaterials. APRF stands for advanced plated rich fibrin and IPRF stands for injectable uh, plated rich fibrin as well. And you can see a small video that I made here and I'm using here a 50-50 a direct gen product from Implant Direct. Uh, I like to use uh, the biomaterials uh, with the bone graft because it keeps the particles together. They are not flowing everywhere and um, it's, it's easy uh, to place. My assistant is typing from the lingual side and I'm going to demonstrate how to use the direct gen flex in the next slide. So the demineralized cortical allograft sheet, you can soak it in minutes. You can use um, also the uh, patient's own blood. And in this case, I use the Axidate from the PRF, which is full of factors. It's exactly what I need. I need those cells to communicate with each other and form the bone. So um, I um, gently um, uh, use the scissors, and I make sure I have a very good fit on my membrane. I open a small flap towards the buckle and a small flap towards the lingual. And I wanted to make sure it's all tucked in on top of it. And then I did, in this case, a supraperiosteal release incision to make sure I cover um, completely this. And I have release from a buckle as well from the lingual side. But does the bone loss occur due to lack of vascularization? And uh, thank you, Elisa Shokrum, for sharing uh, this Mamoto concept with me. Uh, Dr. Joseph Shokrum is my mentor in biological factor. I just wanted to give credit to him. He's, a, he's an excellent mentor to me. And uh, I um, wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about the bone loss and the lack of vascularization. Um, <clears throat> It is important to uh, suture right. You can do a beautiful procedure, surgical procedure, and you can mess up at the end uh, doing the wrong sutures or materials, and it's not uh, you know flowing everywhere. It's not approximate the flap. But the promotion of vascularization, again, you need growth factors, and you need flap management. And again, blood is life. So Mamoto came with this idea that pressure on the crest of the uh, uh, pressure on the crest by the flap can create bone loss, and we have horizontal and vertical bone loss. So we do not want to have that on top of the ridge. Uh, so we, um, Dr. Shukrun came up with this idea using like an apical mattress suture, and you are going to see in this slide. And here I place implants, and I wanted to show you this because you can see very clearly that uh, the apical mattress sutures is done about one centimeter away from the ridge, so I have less pressure on the ridge. And of course, you can use additional um, sutures, you know, to complete it. By the way, five gram force uh, done by a study in a past was okay to be on top of the ridge. Uh, I just wanted to mention them to you. So let's see about um, Angelina. And G Angelina presented my practice with a fracture, fracture tooth, and she had a feature on the buckle. I ended up with a fenestration of tissue and the buckle plate, and I was devastated, and I had to fix it. So a cytoplasm membrane came to my rescue. So I used the cytoplasm membrane, and uh, because I'm talking here about the pontic area, what I want to do is to have volume and space stability. So I'm using a very slow resorption material and more mineral content and more cortical and a xenograft. And direct us, which is a xenograft from Implant Direct, was fantastic for these uh, cases. As you can see, the uh, the healing was good and uneventful. But what we should do to avoid socket shrinkage? Uh, what are the alternatives out there? I am doing a lot of crown lengthening procedures in my practice, and I'm doing about three a week. 
So this is an underutilized uh, procedure for joint dentists, and if you really don't want to use that buccal bone, if you wanted to keep that tooth in, um, do more crown lengthenings. And the second procedure I wanted to mention to you, it's a root submerged technique developed by Dr. Salama in 2007. And this is a picture of one of my cases when the patient was extremely uh, compromised and has a very uncontrolled diabetes and I decided to keep those roots submerged. It's amazing, amazing technique when you're talking for pontics on your planning not to place implant to implant next to each other to be able to have a nice uh, pontic area. So um, I love this technique uh, which Dr. Salama did in 2007. And uh, the superstar technique uh, new on the market is the socket shield developed by Harsler in 2010 when uh, he decided to keep a fragment of the tooth as a shield to the buccal bone. Why? Because that bundle bone, which is in uh, between 2 and 4, or maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.4 millimeter, and uh, you are going to bother by taking out the, the, the PDL as well, the, the periosteum, is going to function as a, as a shield uh, towards, your, towards your implant. So many studies are coming up, uh, and uh, Dr. Howie Glugman is working, I know, in South Africa for this, and thank you for that, Dr. Howie. Now, let's talk about less traumatic extractions. And as I told you before, I can't say a traumatic because I do feel like cause some trauma to the tissue and bone. I'm using, as you saw in the videos, a needle diamond PDL bore. Uh, I do not like to use elevators, but sometimes I do. Periotomes is a great idea. And uh, uh, forceps, um, uh, you can use extended forceps. Salvin has them. And my favorite procedure is to do a root separation. And then I am degranulation the socket. I'm curatizing. I'm curatizing. I wanted to make sure I have bleeding. I am because blood is life again. And I have an infection free site ready for grafting. And do not forget to evaluate your socket walls by the end of the procedure so you know what kind of procedure you are going to do. So now talking about mandibular molars, we know we have, um, uh, we have a mesial and a distal root um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to just make an incision right in the middle. I, do, I stay away from the buccal bone here and if I have to, I'm going to separate even more and I take those roots one um, after another. And and as you can see, I got a very good result. I still have bone infurcation, which I like to see that. And I didn't damage the buccal or the lingual plates. Now, talking about the upper premolars, I like to do my incision, mesiodistal. And uh, in this case, I decided to go with um, um, PRF, which is I make here a fibrin material. Um, fibrin is a recipient for cytokines, and the fibrin acts as, a, acts as a provisionary extracellular matrix described by Mazzucco in 2010. Uh, APRF stands again for advanced places rich fibrin, which uh, I'm using in my practice for the past three years, guided by Dr. Joseph Shokrun, and I'm in love with this procedure because I can use it for so many things. PRF inducing as well vascularization in vivo, and that was demonstrated by Mamoto in 2013. And again, blood is life. Now we are talking about root separation and root trunk height discussion. When we are planning to take out the tooth, immediately our eyes are going towards the apex of the teeth. So we are going at the apex, the nerves, but nobody pays attention at the trunk. And that's important because um, it's not important only for endodontists to make sure they don't perforate, you know, the floor um, uh, or the floor of the of the, the trunk. It's important for periodontists as well make sure the forcation area is safe. But also, it's important for us doing extractions because we know how to treat and plan in these cases accordingly. So when we have a lot of bone in a forcation, we know the shrinkage is going to be less. But when we know uh, we have less bone infurcation, we know I'm going to have a lot of shrinkage, and I'm going to demonstrate this by the healing. 
when you don't know where the feature is coming uh, from, I like to use this method that you can see on the upper right screen, good approach in the fistula, and believe it or not, in this case, the fistula is not coming from the cracked tooth, actually it's coming from the tooth in front of it. So uh, we ended up doing a root canal for the first molar. I ended up to extract that tooth. As you can see, uh, the technique is uh, to separate the palatal root. Uh, it's called like a T um, a separation. And then I'm going to do the mesial and distal and take it one after another. But let's see the root separation um, and the root trunk uh, height here in two weeks of peeling with no graft. You can um, see the difference in between the right and the left case. The, the, the thicker the trunk, the less resorption, the thinner trunk, plant grafting. The coronal part of the saw head is the critical part of the extraction. And that what we saw in the um, amazing uh, study done by Dr. Kardaropoli in 2003. And of course, the healing, uh, the healing looks so well because we are talking about maxilla and we, hope we have more vessels and faster healing, so blood is life again. So let's appreciate this one more time, how fast is this healing in maxilla. So every time when you wanted to take more cells or you wanted to um, do autogenous bone, sometimes it's a good idea to go to maxilla because it's full of good cells. How about the host? We are talking about immunity, smoking, lipids and cholesterol, and vitamin D deficiency, and there are about over 300 articles in the literature at this point. So immunity, everyone knows that if your immunity is lacking, you are going to lack healing, and I'm not going to get too much in details of this, and we have to be aware of our uh, patients with diabetes especially, and smoking as well, talking about the nicotine, and the blood is life, the nicotine does vasoconstriction to the vessels, but we know we can still place uh, implants in the smoking, and that case I showed that um, it was a woman and she was smoking two packs a day, and the implant was integrated. So it's really up to the host. And the lipids and the cholesterol, we are going to talk them soon about them. Vitamin D levels. I am checking the vitamin D levels when I'm planning uh, any implant case or larger implant cases or um, ridge reconstructions. And the lacking of vitamin D slows the metabolism and is very frequent in patients with depression and smokers and patients over 65. Now, how about the cholesterol and the bone? The cholesterol metabolism occurs mainly in osteoblasts, and that we know from the literature from Brodor was published in 2009. The cholesterol is very toxic for osteoblasts. When you see a fat bone, they just cancel the implant, and that's my recommendation. Practice growth with socket preservation. For multiple extractions, offer some free service to your patients. Reduce your clinical fee by buying a bone graft in quantity. Use a bigger membrane and trim it when you're planning to do more teeth. Charge extra for complications, for example, sinus repair. Practice to make it makes it perfect, so don't give up. You will get faster and faster. And train your tumor planning coordinator for all this. Practice growth with socket preservation. Have a great relation with your urgent care centers. It's a great referral program. Saturday emergencies are gold. I used to work for many years Saturdays, and uh, I have news. I am working right now only one Saturday a month. And I transform a surgical extraction fee to a high product production procedures. I advise you to take your time for anesthesia. Happy patients will refer more patients to you. And charge a separate fee for your membranes and separate fee for bone graft. But sometimes I do it as a whole entire um, fee. Now, understanding biology and biomaterials and performing less traumatic extractions are key for a successful socket preservation. And what's your comfort zone? And this is a, a picture of um, my wonderful team that um, uh, we had a couple of weeks ago in Vegas. We did a, a team bonding. Uh, we went for a continued education course. And um, uh, it's all about how you take the risk. So we decided to go on the zip lines. 
And uh, going back on the biomaterials, and if you are not sure about the biomaterials and the socket preservation or guideborne regenerations, you know, Implant Direct has an amazing course in Las Vegas, and I invite everyone to go if you wanted to learn more. And thank you all, everyone, for watching, and um, I am ready for questions. And if I am not going to be able to answer to all of you, please feel free to send me questions at uh, tatledelia at yahoo.com. Thank you, everyone, for watching. So I'm getting a question. It says, can cellulars or cortical or mix of both or both, which is the best for socket preservation strictly for implant placement? So depends when you are going to place your implant. If you are going to do an early placement, uh, you can use an allograft. If you are play, play, uh, planning to do like a delayed placement, you can use a xenograft, which it has a slow resorption. So usually I use sometimes a 50-50, and I go back for in four months. When using a non-resorbable membrane, you wanted to keep it in for four, six weeks, non-resorbable. How do you keep it under the gingiva or in place when the sutures end up uh, losing their effectiveness after five to seven days? Well, you can use uh, different sutures. There are um, lots of sutures out there that are uh, lasting long, longer. You can, um, um, they are lasting up to two weeks sometimes, and you can use uh, those and they're not losing their elasticities. And also, I can, um, um, you can penetrate the membrane, and you can touch it to the buccal or the lingual side. What do you mean by fat bone? Fat bone means when you open uh, the bone or you take a tooth out, you'll see uh, like a yellow bone. And that means it's uh, full of lipids. Thank you for that. What do you mean by fat bone? Uh, two questions, OK. How long do you wait after socket preservation before placing implant? Let's say if you are um, doing a socket preservation, depends what kind of materials you are, biomaterials you are using. So as I said before, delayed or early placement depends on your conditions about the tissue, what's the situation, is the patient coming back. So if you use a um, allograft, you can go back in four months. And sometimes biomaterials, you know, depend. Uh, sometimes if you use like a slow resorption one, you can go in six months or eight months, you can still find some granules out there. So four to six months usually is a, is a good answer. Do you recommend to pack bone graft also? Yes, I do like to pack the bone graft. I'm not sure if you're talking about the socket graft or the, the, the gap of the implant. I like to pack it gently, so I wanted to make sure I have vascularization in the area. So the vessels will, will go through, and I will have a very nice uh, outcome. For the, for the implant gap, yes, I do it. And I use a slow resorption material uh, like a xenograft. You can use allograft as well, but it has to be mineralized. If I get primary closure with cytoplasm, PTFE membrane, when do I need to remove the membrane? I will say in about three weeks. What blood cholesterol level is contraindicated for implant placement? And um, um, it depends what you are doing. Usually I'm asking uh, like a lipid panel from, uh, from my physician as well. And you can use the cholesterol and the lipid as well. And you can see it on, uh, on that. Usually it's LDL less than 1.40 grams per liter. Um, when do I remove the PTFE membrane when I don't get the primary closure in three weeks? Um, what is your technique for efficiency suturing with the barrier membranes for a single tooth extraction? Uh, suturing with the barrier membrane. I can use it. You can uh, use it uh, on the buckle and on the lingual, or you can use like a crisscross suture, and that's a very good one. Uh, in the beginning, you will struggle with that, but it's very easy to do it. Um, Crisscross, it's easy. Do you recommend to pack bone above the dental implant? Yes. I usually graft all my gaps, as I said before, with mineralized uh, bone. can be allograft or xenograft, but has to be mineralized and has to be like a slow, slower resorption. Xenograft is very slow. Do you recommend, uh, does beta serasorb work? I didn't work with serasorb yet. What brand bird do you use for PDL? It's uh, from uh, um, uh, Bressler. How long do you wait for bone to heal uh, to place the implant? I said about four months. If, if uh, sometimes if I do like an early placement, I can go in, um, in um, I can do about three months. Where do you go for implant training? I went to Implant Direct. 
also I had training from UCLA as well. Um, since the session is being recorded, can I watch the presentation again before taking the exam? Yes. Does Xenograft allow drill well uh, without increasing temperature to the point of proteolysis? Yes. If you don't, if you, if you um, depend on the host as well, I, I drill pretty good through it. Don't wait way, way too long. Um, there is a study I can send you about the biomaterials uh, resorption in time. Uh, also, the period spot has uh, the same um, uh, the same information as well. It it drills pretty good. Um, what is the specific name type of the thin diamond bird that use performance organism extractions uh, from Brassler? I use the PDL bird, but you can use any long diamond birds. Do you have the number of the, the for the Brassler PDL bird? No, but I can send it to you if you email me. Thank you, doctor. Very well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> a lot of questions regarding the immediate, uh, regarding the delayed placement. I go back in four months usually. I like to use mineralize. It's a slow resorption for the gap as well. And I do graft my gaps. I, what other graft bone you use? I'm using the one from Implant Direct. Implant Direct has um, has a, a direct uh, di has a different kinds of allograft um, and is the direct gen as well, which is a xenograft. So direct gen is 50-50, and you can use uh, just um, allograft, and you can use um, uh, cortical or mineral. And um, direct os is xenograft. I apologize for that. How do you use the diamond board? Do you go circumferentially? Yes, I go around the tooth. How do you determine um, resorbable or non-resorbable membrane tanks? Um, depends on the defect. If I feel like uh, the defect is large, I don't like to open the flap uh, to have the supraperiosteal uh, incisions um, to be able to achieve primary closure. I'm more like a non-primary uh, closure uh, type of surgeon. So then I will use the, um, uh, the non-resorbable one, which is the cytoplast, which works really good. Do you need a membrane with poly? Yes. Sometimes I use two, two membranes. I can use, for example, um, like a regular membrane. Sometimes if I feel like I need it more, I can use a collagen plug on top. Or sometimes if you wanted to keep it low to the patient, you can use the biomaterials and you can use as well a collagen plug on top. What if your buckle plate has a tooth fragment stuck to it? Will it cause failure or infection if left in place? Um, are you placing an implant? And that's considered like a socket shield technique, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so uh, some, um, the body knows how to do with it. Mother Nature will take care of it. And eventually, you know, it's going to resorb slowly. Depends how big is the fragment. And sometimes we do that with the wisdom teeth. When we cannot um, take the, the tip of the root out and we don't want it to disturb the infravalor nerve, we are going to leave that fragment in place. Sometimes it migrates to the surface, and sometimes if it's very small enough, it's going to resorb. What suture material do you use? I'm using monofilament uh, mainly. I am using 4.0, 5.0 monofilament black, and I'm using a chrome, um, a chrome 4.0 chrom chromic gut suture, which is a resorbable one. Would you wait to place an implant or bone graft into a socket for an abscess tooth? As I show you in the presentation, I had that for Randy. The secret is to change the pH, to uh, degranulate the socket very well, and uh, to copious irrigate uh, the socket with uh, saline. And uh, you are going to get fresh blood uh, with the fresh cells, and I did before with the abscess as well. I mean, if the abscess is very, um, very big, probably I'm not going to be that adventurous. But uh, usually, yes. If I'm adventurous enough to place an implant, probably not. But I do grafting on abscess tooth, and it was successful. How do you carry the implant material into the socket? Well, you can use it with your with any instrument. Dentistry is something that you can use your imagination for everything. You can use it even with the um, periosteal elevator if you wanted to keep it very simple. Uh, they do have specific carriers for the bone graft uh, as well. If you look at the dental uh, at the um, at the medical instruments as well, especially created for the packing. But you don't need 
sophisticated uh, tools to work with. You just use your imagination. Please explain what you call root submerge technique. Means you are going to have the root submerge under the tissue and you are going to preserve bone that way. It's very frequent and it's very nicely done when, for example, you are planning to have a bridge on anterior area and um, the pontic area can be a root which is submerged under the tissue. So you are going to achieve that beautiful architecture and uh, the pontic area is going to look fantastic. I have different sides of the graph, depends uh, how big is my procedure, I have the point C, the 1 CC, depends how many roots you write. So usually for an anterior you can use like a half of CC. Do you place more cover screws on placement or go straight to healing abutment? Uh, for uh, depends. Depends on the primary stability and also depends if I do have, uh, for example, a denture to cover the area. The denture I know is going to hit and it's going to um, um, affect my osteointegration, so I'm going to submerge my implants. But sometimes for anteriors, the best way to do it, of course, to have uh, the um, uh, to have a perfect provision made, so you can sculpt the tissue, the soft tissue. When do you remove the PTFE membrane if you use it to build up the bone uh, with documentation? When? I remove it at three weeks. And believe it or not, it's so easy to be removed. You, all you have to do is to have a cotton plier and it just slides right out. Sometimes you can use just a small topical anesthetic as well. Yes, I find that I get decent bone after four months of grafting, yet it's still softer than surrounding. And I'm not waiting enough or do I need to change my biomaterials? So there is a study out there showing that at four months, depends what kind of bone graft material you use, um, and um, it's, a, it's a different, um, it's, um, rem uh, that you still have some remaining biomaterial in the socket. And do you remember I said the coronal part is the critical part? So you have a strong bone, to the apex of the implant and then by by waiting the, the uh, coronal bone is going to mature enough. So you are going to be safe as long as you are going to get the primary stability going. Sometimes depends uh, if you are using a xenograft you have to wait probably more. I will wait a little bit more. Do you place graft in the socket before or after the implant is placed? First of course you place the implant and then you are going to um, graft around it. As I showed you before, using the, the cylinder, the, um, the temporary cylinder abutment, you place it in and then you are going to graft around it, nicely packing the bone, and then with your provisional you are going to squish the bone all around to make sure you have a great architecture towards the facial. Sometimes I leave, um, uh, I leave my last um, implant drill inside the socket and I graft around it. I do not pack it, gently pack, and then I place the implant. And in that way, it's going to squeeze the bone graft beautifully around uh, the, my, um, uh, my implant. Do you rut routinely place implant and bone graft at the same time if the socket is normal, healthy, after a non-traumatic extraction? If not, when how do you decide when to wait for a complete healing before placing an implant? So if I have a type 1 socket, which is a perfectly socket with all the walls and I have beautifully um, uh, soft tissue, I will wait 8 weeks and that's called uh, early placement. Your um, uh, osteoclastic activity is gone and the bone is very nice and fresh and you can go back um, um, in 8 weeks if you'd like to. Do you recommend to use patient's own Osteoryze tooth as part of the graft. Yes, that's another procedure out there. They are very successful, and when you are going to grind patients' own tooth and you are using it as a graft, and I saw I saw uh, very successful before. So you can use flex, the direct jam flex, for a wall structure as well as an overlay over the graft and it's cortical bone, so no need to extract it after like a titanium membrane, no. You are going to leave it in place and actually it's going to work beautifully. And sometimes you can add even one membrane on top of it if you wanted to make sure it's protected. So you don't have to remove it. It's amazing. In, um, it's uh, almost the same like in Europe, it's called lamina cortical. It's kind of the same. It's, uh, it works very nice and um, uh, you should try it. 
If you keep the P, uh, PFT, uh, PTFE membrane for longer than three weeks when you do your redocumentation, what will get? Will get infection? No. I had patients I kept it for, I mean, depends, but I had patients I kept it for about four, even to five weeks, and um, I didn't get any infection. Sometimes the membrane uh, comes by itself because you are not going to have sutures anymore in place. Patients are not behaving when the, they have to respect the oral surgery post-operatory instructions and the, they can have suction in their mouth or they're playing with it, so the membrane will come out. And usually if it's stuck in, um, you will not get infection in uh, four or five weeks. With the root submerged technique, how far subgingivally does the top of the root need to be in order to have it up being completely covered? You have to place it under the bone, and I will say about two millimeter under the bone. And make sure you have a nice tissue on top to be covered. If not, um, it's uh, not going to work. And you can seal it as well, the root. Does a plaque take the place of a membrane? Yes. It's called the poor, poor, poor man membrane when we try to save something for our patients. Sometimes I do that. Do you prescribe antibiotics after bone graft to the patient? Well, yes, depends on uh, what situation. So, um, usually I like to give it a 24 hour before, but if the patient comes, of course in emergency, I do, I do, the, I do prescribe antibiotics. Uh, and um, this has to be related with the host as well. If the patient is immune compromised, if they can medication, the age as well. So I do prescribe antibiotics, yes. But if it's a young, young patient with uh, no medical history, antibiotics um, are, not needed, and sometimes, as I told you before in my presentation, I add antibiotics to my graft. So I'm using Flagyl, or I can use a metronidazole and in powder, and I can add it to my biomaterials. What is the difference between using collagen plug versus using bone graft? Which one is better choice to preserve the socket? Well, collagen plug is uh, something that you can imagine is. Um, is just collagen. It's not working as well as the bone graft material. It doesn't function, has, doesn't have the, fun, the same function. It can be used as a membrane to cover the bone graft material. What will happen if you suture the graft tissue with the resorbable membrane secondary closure? I had that happen before. It's just the, um, the membrane will resorb faster. Remember I told you there are different membranes and they have different resorption time. They can be up to 36 weeks, um, one of the membranes, the most popular one, the RTM one. And then if you leave it exposed, um, it's just going to resorb faster. And if you have that situation, I still don't like to squeeze my socket. I like the volume. So you can use a plug cola plug on top of it. What about diabetic patient? Can have dental implants and bone grafts and membranes? This depends on uh, the um, uh, diabetic status of the patient. Usually I'm asking for a hemoglobin A1C and it needs to be controlled. Usually I place implant if the hemoglobin A1C is under um, 6.5. And also if um, they can prove they have a perfect uh, oral hygiene as well. Hemoglobin A1C is the indicator to see if the patient is controlled or not. So I'm, I'm uh, having a very good collaboration with the physician. I place it in smokers as well and it's working. It's all about the host. It's um, not always uh, by the book. So I placed an implant on a patient with, uh, she was smoking like two packs a day and the implant integrated perfectly. Um, on diabetes patient, I had a diabetes patient and I had failure. Um, other patients didn't have failure. Well, it looks like uh, great questions for all of us. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you again, uh, Implant Direct, and thank you, Lisa, from Catapult. I'm looking forward for my next presentation, and uh, have a great night. And if you do have extra questions, don't forget to email me at uh, tatledelia at yahoo.com. Thank you very much.